happy Sunday. Sunday school session for the adult class is now in session. I am Janice Morrison, and today's topic is wisdom feasts. We're coming from the text of Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, 8 through 10, and 13 through 18. Our aim for change today is by the end of the lesson, we will one, compare and contrast the call and the promise of wisdom with that of folly. Desire to walk the path of wisdom and receive its benefits, avoiding the peril of foolishness, and lastly, grow in the fear and knowledge of the Lord as the first step in walking the way of wisdom. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this lesson that we learned from the book of Proverbs on wisdom and folly. God, make us your sons and daughters of wisdom. Give us your spirit of wisdom, God. God, thank you for what we're going to learn today, what we're going to share, what we're going to impart. And we invite you in, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Do a new thing in us. Sit on our laps and have your way. God, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We exalt you. We thank you so much, God, for your goodness and your mercy. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. How y'all been? It's been a minute, hasn't it? But I'm so glad and so excited for the opportunity, the honor, and the privilege to come back to the adult class and teach again. I have really missed you, and I hope that today's lesson will be a good jump start for our um, continued Sunday School lessons on the virtual way. I really applaud Bethel for, that, uh, for this attempt. To God be the glory. Our in focus today reads in this wise. James's wife died from complications of Parkinson's disease. He was feeling lonely and having a hard time adjusting to living alone, and his son Greg started to worry about him. Greg asked his daughter Carol if she would stay with her grandpa for a few weeks in the summer since she would be in between semesters. Carol would often find James dabbing his eyes then pretending it was just allergies. Grandpa, it will take time to recover from grandma's death. I'm glad I'm here. Oh, you're sweet. I hope you're, you'll get to go enjoy yourself um, some of this summer too instead of just hanging around with a sad old man, James said. Now tell me about this move I heard about from your father. Okay, I met a new boyfriend, Quentin, online. He lives in LA and has come to visit me three times. He wants to come and live with, he wants me to come and live with him after I finish college. Grandpa, I think he might be the one. Carol said, getting more and more excited. Carol, I love you. That's why I want you to listen to me. I don't think this is a wise decision. You don't know him. He could be trying to take advantage of you. Please don't give your heart away just yet. Pray and ask God for wisdom about your relationship with this man. Why should we take consideration the godly counsel of older adults? Oh my goodness, this is a good one. We really do need to take heed to godly counsel and especially godly counsel from our older uh, adults that are in the Lord. That is so important. Our keep in mind today is forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. And that's from the sixth verse of today's lesson. Let's read our focal verses together, okay? Verse one, wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts. She has mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She has sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of understanding. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Verse 13 talks about the foolish woman. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth in the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. 
And as far as him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. This lesson today builds upon the lesson from last week. And last week we discussed the value of wisdom, the rewards of wisdom, and the pursuit of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. What I gained from last week's lessons are three points I want to share with you. Wisdom is <clears throat> integrated in our everyday lives. Number two, we need it to avoid sin creeping into our lives. And number three, godly wisdom causes us to have lasting success, the type of success that is a blessing not only to you, but to others. Last week's lesson continued in the theme of wisdom. And so this week, we're talking about wisdom's feast. We're talking about how one woman, or the personification of a woman, in the term of wisdom, and personification is giving an inanimate object a human personality or characteristic. The book of Proverbs reveals two themes, wisdom and folly. Wisdom is knowledge, understanding, discretion, obedience, and instruction based on God's word and reverence of God. Folly is everything opposite of that. So uh, I love to uh, entertain when I do get the opportunity to have friends over for a light meal or little snacks or hors d'oeuvres. And this lesson is so appropriate and it's an appropriate description of a wise woman. In the first 10 verses, the first uh, chapter 9 verses 1 through 10, we see her preparing for a feast, preparing for people to come to the house. So verse 1 says that wisdom hath built her house, and she has hewn it out of seven pillars. Now in my studies, I find those seven pillars could be those foundations that are taught in chapter 8. Or if you turn to James chapter 3, beginning at the 15th, the 13th verse, James is considered the New Testament, Testament equivalent of the book of Proverbs. James is the New Testament book of wisdom. In chapter 3, around the 17th verse, uh, James tells us the different things that build um, our wisdom. And that's the focal point of what I want to get across to you today. I want you to first remember that wisdom built a house and not a tent. We know that a house is permanent and a tent in the biblical days was not permanent, that it could be picked up at any time and taken to another location. So what I want you to draw from that is that wisdom needs a permanent place. It needs to be permanent because that makes it lasting. Number two, I want you to remember that uh, wisdom hewn her house out of the seven pillars. What I learned was most houses in the biblical days had four pillars. You have four corners, you have four pillars, and each of those pillars held up the roof, usually a flat roof. But if a woman had, or a person had, seven columns in their home, that meant they had money. The first column, or the primary column, is the one that's in the center. And then there are three on each side. So in um, taking a look at that, we know that wisdom has uh, different attributes, which include purity, integrity, um, discretion. We want to keep in mind that um, it has knowledge, understanding, prudence, honor, and whole, a whole gamut of things in which wisdom has a foundation. The primary foundation being the word of God and not the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In verse 1, wisdom is, is personified, as we said before. Um, the Only the wise have a home because it's permanent and not the foolish. Let's take a look at verse number 2. Verse 2 says, she has killed her beasts, she has mingled her wine, and she has furnished her table. That's the kind of party, that's the kind of feast I want to go to. I want to go to where they've put thought into the food, they've put thought into what we're going to drink with the food, even the conversation and the place settings. Who wants to go to a wedding or any type of a banquet and sit next to somebody that's complaining, somebody that's ignorant, somebody that chews with their mouth open? 
she took great care, and this is wisdom, she took great care in preparing the feast. She picked the menu, she picked the wine. When they say they, she mingled the wine, that means she either put spices in it or she cut it with water. That means she wants you to get home safe. She wants you to not get any tickets from Kannapolis Highway Patrol. We praise God for her wisdom. Verse three says, she has sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. I want you to pay special attention to this verse because verse three tells us that she had enough money to hire people to go out into the city. Now, not to entice you with riches, but to let you know the wealth that comes with having the wisdom that comes from God. She sent women out to the city and into the high places to, to invite them, not force them, not beat them with the Bible, not tell them they're going to hell, not tell them that they're wrong, but to invite them to the feast. This is modern day evangelism, and I want you to see that in verse 3. God tells us and he sends us out with his heart, and that's evangelism. It's a strategic, it was strategic in going to the high places and the best parts of the city. Their invitation was generally to everybody, but that she knew only the wise were going to accept. We're going to see the difference in that when we talk about um, girlfriend Folly when she invites people to her party. <clears throat> Verse 4 through 6, wisdom tells us how to live a good life with meat, wine. Those are the substances. Those are the scriptures. Those are church attendants. That is forsaking not for the fellowship with the saints. That's what the meat and the wine and um, all those things that go into there. Wisdom has done her work, and now she's crying out from the place in the city. It is the people's response that makes the party possible. She is calling out for the simple who lack understanding. She is looking for those who are hungry for wisdom, those that know their hunger and are humble enough to seek it. That's so important because we can't share the word of God or witness or minister the word of God to people who don't have the knowledge and who don't have the hunger or motivation to receive the word of God. If you're out witnessing or out evangelizing or out sharing your testimony or the goodness of the Lord and people don't respond or people argue with you, it's best not to argue back with them because our lesson today reminds us that wisdom knows when to hold them and when to fold them. She, it is for their good that she invites them, but again, this invitation benefits those who know their need and are willing to do whatever it takes to meet it. How will you stay hungry for wisdom and humbly seek it out even when you look successful? Yeah, you look good, you got it all together, you doing your thing, but it is a wise person, a humble person that knows that every day they need to build upon their relationship with God. Every day we need to read the word. We can't go a day without prayer. We need to put fasting somewhere in our walk with God. And this is the wisdom that we have. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 14 tells us about the common sense and sound wisdom that is in the world. The Bible later tells us in the New Testament that worldly knowledge or worldly wisdom is sensual. So you can, if you listen to a person long enough, you can tell whether they're, um, my grandma used to say, whether it's book smart or street smart. Uh, verses 8 through 10 get, gives us a look at the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom reflects on the behavior of a scoffer versus the wise. Listen carefully, a scoffer is very arrogant and self-centered. Anytime you see a person that loves to talk about themselves, they are arrogant. They do not like for anyone to criticize them, so they only respond with hate towards others. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? A wise person will appreciate correction. They'll appreciate reprimand that's given in the right manner and from the right place and from the right spirit. The wise enjoy instruction because they want to become wiser and to learn more. Of course, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. That is the foundation of any, any house, of any permanent dwelling. The knowledge of the Holy One and its insight. This is where life begins with the fear of the Lord. 
Now, keeping in mind when we say fear, we're not talking about afraid and sh and trembling and shivering. It's me. It means also being in awe and having respect of the Lord. And when we have awe and respect of the Lord or anyone in position of uh, of God speaking for the Lord, then that is respect. That is reverence. Reverence. Back then and even today, wisdom begins when we choose to live our lives with an awareness that God sees how we treat one another and how we treat the earth that he gave us to be stewards of. Wisdom happens when we realize that the way we deal with life in general reveals whether we rever, revere God or not. And of course, reverence is worship that enables us to hear the wise sayings of the spirit. Submission to God is the first step towards a wise life. How can you say that you're wise when you don't even submit to God? How can you say that you're wise when you don't even seek God's counsel, when you don't even set yourself in a position to hear from him? How do you react towards someone who gets angry after you try to give them constructive criticism? It's frustrating, right? It is because your heart and your intention is for them to be better and to know better. But when they come against that and they counteract that, that can be um, frustrating. Now, let's talk about girlfriend folly. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that they didn't spend so much time on describing a woman of folly because the Bible wants us to be a woman of wisdom. But we know a woman of folly by the description here in verse 13. Verse 13 says that she is clamorous, she is simple, and she knows nothing. That means she's ignorant, and she's loud, and she's boisterous. We know that she is loud and boisterous and simple because the feast that she prepared for her guests, anybody that'll come, anybody that'll, that she says, come here, and they come, uh, she only prepared water and bread. Now, I would rather have meat and wine any day over bread and water, but the Bible tells us about the people that turn in or people that heed or people that obey a foolish woman. It says here in verse 17, uh, verse 16, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Uh, I don't know about you, but when you're in love, uh, anything tastes good, anything looks good. And, and I'm not saying anything as in who the person that you're in love with. Sometimes food tastes better. Sometimes your, your vision and your, the colors look brighter and life seems so much sweeter when you're, you're in love or when you think you're in love. But verse 18 is, is the clutch because it says, but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Who want to eat there? I know I don't. Folly is the opposite of wisdom because foolishness re rejects the teaching of God. Foolishness rejects anything that is of God. Who wants to be foolish? Today I want you to keep in mind that the call of wisdom is not in secret. It's done in public. It's done out loud in public places. The invitation to Christ, the invitation to know God and to fear God is made to everybody. But unfortunately, everybody is not going to come to Christ. Everybody is not going to heed the call to Christ. We can't force people to want to learn or to want wisdom. We must invite them rather than force them to come. That's the beauty of God. That's the beauty of salvation. It's an invitation. I'm setting a feast for you. It's going to be great. It's going to be delicious. Please come. I need you to come. When Jesus, oftentimes, he, when he didn't reply to the Pharisees or to the people that were considered scoffers, he is the perfect template. He is the ideal. He teaches us how to respond to people that do not want wisdom. I need you to know that wisdom exposes wickedness. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 14 through 15, that there are advantages to those that seek wisdom. And the biggest advantage being eternal life. But there, there are other what we call benefits. 
The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that God daily loads us up with benefits. And one of those benefits is greatly being wisdom and discernment. For those that are willing to believe God and to receive his wisdom, they must be nurtured. It is perfect that you, you choose the day uh, that you walk up to Christ and you, give, you walk up the altar and you give God your heart and you give the pastor your hand and you join the church. But it's so important for your vitality, for your growth in Christ, that you continue to nurture that growth by adding to wisdom, prudence, understanding, and gaining power as you grow in Christ. And it's our job as the body of Christ to nurture those that are coming to Christ. God sets the standards of right and wrong. We call that his righteousness. And we need to always, always, always understand that we lean not on our own understanding, but God, um, but give it all to God. We lean on God and his understanding. Verses 13 through 15 tells us that the foolish woman uh, made decisions on her, on her own and without God. Um, there are references in the scriptures to illicit sex, even in Proverbs chapter 7. Um, the foolish woman claims that stolen water is sweet and that bread eaten in secret is pleasant. She entices young men to her secret rendezvous. However, after momentary joy, she lets them realize that there is no life where they are. The people who come to her banquet don't realize enjoying her feast will lead them to the place of the dead. It is very important to stop and think about the consequences of sin before yielding to temptation. It's not to say that you're going to do everything perfect, that you're going to dot every I and cross every T, but we need to stop and think and ask for God's wisdom and his discernment when we're making decisions. Now the Bible tells us that the devil is cunning and that he comes to us as an angel of light. So don't beat yourself up when you don't make, when you do make mistakes. Uh, we often make our decisions based on what looks great to us today, even though it may lead us to destruction. Uh, yep, she's beautiful today, but she don't have any sense. Uh, the Bible says that a foolish woman tears her house down, but a wise woman builds it up. You're, you're looking at the Coca-Cola Coca bottle shape, but you're not looking at what's going on inside the head. You're looking at these tall, handsome, muscular men, but they don't um, know how to handle their money. They don't know how to manage a household. We often make those poor decisions, but thanks be unto God who causes us to prosper when we give it to him. Folly deceives us, but wisdom instructs us. How do you think you would recognize if folly tried to entice you into doing something that may lead you down the path to destruction? I just told you. When you realize that you've gone down the wrong path, stop, repent, and return to God. God is so faithful and he's so forgiving that when he when he calls us to him, when he invites us to him, that uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. Whether you have the wisdom to share with others or in need of wisdom yourself, a meal is a perfect setting to engage others in wise discussion. I want to challenge you in the next couple of weeks or after July 17th when North Carolina opens back up to have a meal. It's cookout time, y'all. But I, I don't want you to just get together and celebrate being able to get together. I want you to share the word and the love of God with those people. Make it clear that wisdom and folly are two separate feasts to attend. I have had such a pleasure reading over this lesson and being able to share it with you. My prayer is that you make good choices in the coming week. My prayer is that the spirit of wisdom abounds in you and around you, on you and through you. I pray that you not only make good choices, but that you hear the word of God in your ear and in your heart and in your spirit throughout the week, throughout the coming weeks. 
and that the choices that you make not only become a blessing to you, but they become a blessing to those around you because you're a blessing. Listen, I love you. I pray for you. I miss you. And I know that God is working behind the scenes to get us all back together again. But until then, you be blessed and keep your head up in Jesus' name.